HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth, where we're exploring all sorts of business topics. Experts from around the world join me, your host, Diane Helbig, for a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. Take what you need, when you need it. Featured on Inc.com, Forbes, and MSNBC's Your Business, this podcast is recognized as one of the best podcasts for small business, sales, leadership, social media, and more. When it comes to business, Accelerate Your Business Growth has got it covered. And now on with the show. My guest today is Matt Powell. Matt is CEO at Quant Hub, a leading data upskilling and assessment platform that helps companies create a data literate workforce across the entire enterprise. Prior to Quant Hub, Matt spent 15 years running product and tech at PE backed companies including building a product and engineering organization at Daxco, delivering 10 times revenue growth, seven acquisitions, and three enormously successful recapitalizations. Matt led the team to deliver the first machine learning AI solution to the gym and fitness market. Thanks so much for joining me today, Matt. Yeah, thanks for having me, Diane. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So let's talk some about this upskilling um, for data skills. Explain why companies should care about that, if you would. Yeah, it's it's really that in this day and age, you can't you can't look anywhere, you can't do anything without you know interacting with data, and and it's in so many different ways, and it's across the entire enterprise, and it's it's not just a matter of being. Um, you know, when you hear people say that they need data skills, then a lot of times our minds all go to, oh my goodness, we need to be highly technical data scientists and, and we think of wizards and <laughs> all, of these, all of these crazy skills and we're like, oh my goodness, I have, that's never going to be me. Um, but, you know, if you're in HR and you're, you're hiring and uh, you're hiring talent acquisition and you're trying to figure out where your best hires are coming from, well, look at the data you know, pull the data out of your applicant tracking system and, and try to figure out where your best hires are coming from and then actually start doing more of your sourcing activity where those best hires are coming from. That's, that's just a simple way of using data to be more effective. And, and the reality is that exists across the entire workforce, whether it's sales, marketing. Marketing is an exceptionally driven, data-driven in this day and age. And, and there are ROI metrics backing up how important it is to use data in each and every of these areas, sales, marketing, HR, finance, um, certainly on the technical side, operations. And, and so it's just not really optional, if you will, to have data skills in the modern workforce. It's becoming a requirement. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, I, when I do sales training, one of the first things that I said that we do is look backward um, a, around our top 20 clients over history right. to determine where they came from. Yeah, absolutely. So, right? So we can just repeat what works. Yeah, and, and you know, really there are different types of, 
of analytics. And it's not a matter of understanding in depth necessarily what those are, but that's, that's an example of just, you know, you're using descriptive analytics to, to look at the past and, and understand what happened. And then you're applying diagnostic analytics and, and which is actually then why did that happen and understanding the insights out of that. And that's where, you know, you don't have to be doing predictive analytics and AI and all this kind of stuff to get value out of data. It's as simple as, like you said, looking at what happened in the past and understanding why that happened so that you can better prepare for the future. And right. so there's not a mystery or, a, or there's, you know, there's, there's, it doesn't have to be so technical. It's just getting value out of the data that, that, you know, exists around us every day. Yeah. That's why I'm glad we're talking about this. Cause I do think uh, you know, people, they hear data and they either go directly to marketing and nowhere else or right. they think, you know, above my pay grade. I, <laughs> exactly. <okay>. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so let's talk about the bottom line. What kind of business lift can be expected from being more data driven and data literate, do you think? Yeah, it's a great question. There, there's a lot of good research. Accenture and Click did a um, did a, a pretty good analysis on uh, um, the value of being more data driven. And so, in their um, in their analysis, there's a three to five percent increase in the the sort of market cap of companies that are um, more highly data literate. Um, if you look at uh, marketing. If you look at marketing numbers, the kind of ROI from that same perspective, that ROI perspective, um, you see that marketing organizations that are highly data driven deliver a 5x ROI on their marketing wow. dollars. And, and um, marketing organizations that are not highly data driven deliver a, a 2x return on, on marketing dollars. And so those are just a couple examples. Of, of areas where, you know, it's, it, this is significant. These are significant dollars here. Um, if you look at um, L&D waste, um, you know, we spend a lot of money on, or sorry, um, waste on, on BI solutions. So we all have our favorite reporting solutions in companies. And there's, um, I think the number is, it's about 74% of employees have access to these BI solutions, but only 20% have the skills to actually use them effectively. Wow. And so if you start thinking about the cost of BI licensing, you know, whether it's your Tableau or these types of platforms, when you're rolling it out to 74% of the employee population and the cost on average is about $1,500 per employee for that license, that's a lot of money that you're spending on those licenses when most people don't have the skills to use them. So they're just all these examples where both top line and bottom line, you know, there's significant um, dollars here that, you know, from an opportunity perspective. That's crazy. I mean, that really is significant. Wow. Yeah. One, one actually of my favorite ones is, is that on average, there's research that shows that employees lose 43 hours um, per year in just frustration from, uh, from working with data. And so not understanding the data, be intimidated by it. Um, there actually is, there are studies that show that people take sick days because of this frustration. And you don't, it's shocking to think about this, but people are really intimidated by data. And, and when they don't have the skills, um, that intimidation, you know, leads to stress and anxiety. And, and so um, those are just, that's just another example of, of real dollars, which you wouldn't think about, you're right. We don't think about right. people missing work because of just fear of working with data. That seems extreme, <laughs> but you know, when that's the type of thing that leads to anxiety and stress. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Isn't like, that I, something it's, it's, yeah. it's, these stats are, are real, real studies and it's, it's just amazing. <laughs> Oh my gosh, but it's good to know because it, it's so interesting how it ends up impacting so many, uh, impacting an organization in so many different ways. Absolutely, yeah. Think of. All yeah, right. It, yeah, it is. Will you explain for the listeners what data literacy is? Yeah, there, there. So there are a lot of definitions. There are sort of standard definitions where people say read, write, um, you know, leverage data, 
Gartner had a definition where you're kind of read, write, reading, writing, um, speaking data in context. So it's within your particular situation. And so those are sort of those broad definitions. Um, I like to really more distill it down to it. It depends on the function and it depends on, you know, kind of what you're doing, but it, it goes back to just a few examples, I think highlight it better where, you know, when you're in, let's say you're in a customer support role and you're logging cases, you know, from customer communication, or maybe you're in a sales role and you're logging um, interactions in a CRM, you don't realize it, but you're actually creating data. And, and so you have a really important role. And, and these are some of these are entry level roles in organizations, but they are the tip of the spear, if you will, for creating data that the organization is going to analyze. And so you have a really critical role in data quality. And, and so an example of data, a, a data literacy skill is, is understanding your role in that data quality life cycle, understanding that, you know, if you're in customer support and maybe one of the fields is what area of the product, you know, this particular issue is related to. And if you're just filling in default values, you're, you're, you're forever um, affecting the quality of that data. And so any analysis downstream where they're trying to figure out, well, where are all of our quality issues coming from in our product is, is obviously going to be hampered by, by that type of data quality issue. And so just an example of data literacy is just understanding how data is going to be used, understanding my role in that data quality, understanding use cases, um, so that throughout the organization, when I when I see data like that, that I might be creating or data that my peers are creating or using, I understand how it may actually be analyzed downstream. And so I'm starting, then what happens is you start recognizing data around you. And so a data literate individual is one that thinks about that, recognizes data around them, understands um, potential use cases for that data, and then starts understanding, you know, a little bit of data visualization. What are some of these charts for? Um, you know, how do I read and interpret these charts that come from maybe the CEO sends out um, some sort of monthly recap of the business and there are charts in there. Do I understand what those charts are for? Do I understand the analysis being presented and, and, you know, the insights that are being drawn from that analysis and, and why. So those are just a couple examples of, of you know, more tangible um, data, data literacy type skills that, that are important across the workforce because we all sort of interact with data, um, you know, every day. I think that's just incredibly important. You know, when you think about it, we're only as good as the data that we have. And so if people don't understand sort of the thread uh, of the data that, the, well, A, that they are creating data, I, I thought that was really an interesting point. And, and the thread and the impact, then they're not, I mean, who knows what they're gonna input or how. Exactly. Right. Yeah. They don't have to be the ones doing the analysis. Um, yeah. That's maybe an advanced level of data literacy. And, and certainly plenty of individuals are headed down that path as well. Um, but you don't have to go there, but it's important to understand what those people are doing. Maybe not how they're doing it, but right. you know, what's the purpose of that analysis that's happening downstream. If you start understanding that and that you start realizing that you actually have a role in it. Um, not only are you creating the data they're probably using, but then when they actually deliver those insights, who's acting on them? It's probably you. <laughs> they're the <laughs> ones creating the insights, but it actually comes right back to the sales team to use it, the marketing team. Um, you know, some maybe the analysis created the market segmentation. And now we're going to figure out, well, how do we go after that, that segmented market? And how do we get our message to the right people at the right time so they convert into leads? And then our salespeople are trying to figure out, well, which of these leads do I need to act on? And how do I act on them? And all of that stuff is, is you know, influenced by some sort of insights that came from data. And so the salesperson is now the consumer of those analytics and understanding those visualizations and understanding those insights. So it, it all kind of comes full circle. You create, oftentimes the people on the tip of the spear are creating that data and then the data is analyzed downstream and then it comes right back to them in, form of, in the form of insights 
and visualizations and data stories that they're now going to use and act on to deliver the ultimate business outcome. Wow. That, it's so interesting. At this time, I'd like to take a sponsor break. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. And I'm sure you know that Audible.com has thousands of audiobook titles to choose from, but you might not know about the other content. There's podcasts, Audible Originals, Guided Meditations. Uh, my favorite thing is to be able to listen to different kinds of things all on the same platform. I think it's a time saver uh, and it's like a productivity uh, hack for me. I don't have to go jumping from one platform to another. Uh, so we're offering you a free trial. You can go to audibletrial.com slash business growth, sign up for that free trial, and then explore on your own. You know, check out the audiobooks, check out the other programs, see what really, you know, resonates with you. Interested in getting some help with your sales strategy? Pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. What I want to ask this question. So, so let's talk about um, data literacy programs mm -hmm. and, you know, what that looks like, because that, that's what I'm, I guess, ultimately what I'm curious about is how does an organization go about making sure that their people have that level of understanding? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it feels a little daunting when you think, okay, right. well, who needs, who needs these skills? And one of our, you know, one of our customers is Southern company is a large utility um, conglomerate fortune, fortune 500 company out of Atlanta, and they have 30,000 employees, you know, and so how do you actually, <laughs> it's a little daunting to say, well, the entire workforce needs these skills. So let's go train 30,000 employees <laughs> on yeah. those skills. That's a little daunting. And, and so, you know, it, it starts obviously, well, different organizations approach this type of cultural change differently. Some are very strong, top-driven, you know, top-down driven organizations where it comes from the executives, you need that buy-in and, you know, there's, there's an element of, okay, well, this becomes a priority in all employees day. And, and so that's certainly one way to approach it. And you have to have some of that to impact a change at this scale without question. Um, but, yeah. but, you know, a lot of organizations are, you know, the way they get things to executives is through, you know, almost skunk works, if you will, where, you know, the, you get pockets of the organization that start embracing this type of concept and start showing value and then the executives buy in. And so usually it's a combination of both of those is what, what I've seen is that you have some executives, some that understand the value of data and that they're proponents of this type of program. And then you start implementing that program in small pockets of the organization and demonstrating the value. And then you can have a broader rollout across, across the company. Um, but you know, what type of solution is necessary to, to quote unquote train yeah. 30,000 people. You can't just roll out licenses to a training product and say, Hey, here you go. 30,000 people. Here's a license to, yes. you know, what, whatever, whatever training platform is, is happened that happens to be the one you've implemented internally, you know, go, go learn data. <laughs> it <laughs> doesn't quite, it doesn't quite work that way as, no. as you would imagine, um, part of it is, it, it's a little bit, and we kind of talk about this internally at Quanhub, it's a little bit like having parents get their kids to eat their vegetables. So we feel like we sell to the parents. <laughs> We're selling to the parents who are trying to get their kids to eat their vegetables because you know, even like in this conversation, we're having some of these things are surprising stats, right? It's, it's yeah. you know, that data is this pervasive and it's, and it's, there's this value that exists there. Well, people don't really know that, you know, it's not quite intuitive yet that, oh my goodness, I'm a salesperson. I need to go learn data skills. Right. We're not quite there yet. And we will be, I think, but we're not quite there yet. So, you know, really there's, there's an element of, of getting the parents to force their kids to eat their vegetables, which in this case is getting the managers to have their employees learn data skills as a priority. And the way we think about it is it has to be a little bit every day. This is not a send, that, send the entire employee base off for a month and have them all learn data skills. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. If they did that, they're going to forget it all right after they finish, <laughs> which is the way learning oftentimes works. And so, yeah. you know, we're much, we much more believe in 
and sort of the methodology a lot of the language learning platforms have implemented, like the Duolingos of the world, learn a mm. little bit every day and, mm. and really get a culture of continuous learning. And then you have a chance to succeed when it comes to getting 30,000 people upskilled. I see. Okay. So that feels different from the way we've done learning in the past. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. Yeah, in school, we, when we think of learning, for some strange reason, th there's been research around since, like, I believe it's the 1940s, that shows that um, having testing be a part of the learning process, not having it be at the end, um, learning a little bit every day, um, revisiting topics you just learned, you know, these types of concepts that the language learning platforms actually do a very good job of this type of micro learning. There are studies that show that that's much, much more effective. But when we think of learning, yeah. for some reason, we think about, we think of school and yeah. we think of a methodology where we learn, 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 test, and then forget. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately in my, uh, you know, long time ago in, in college, I, I, I took a lot of my final exams on no sleep and yeah. I studied all night and I did really well, but I'm here to tell you a day later, I, you can guess how much of that I remembered. Right. <laughs> Not much. Exactly. No. And so that's how we think of learning for some strange reason. Um, I think maybe it's just part of the cultural and it's just how we've all grown up. And, but it's, it's highly, highly ineffective as opposed to learning a little bit every day. And, you know, that's, that's how we work anyway. If I don't know how to do something later today, I'm literally going to Google it. I'm going to spend five right. minutes learning it or revisiting it. And then I'm going to use that information. That's how we learn on the job. And so that should be also how we learn, um, you know, skills that we need. I see. That's really interesting. Okay, now, is this what, like, machine learning and AI, is, is it the same sort of thought process? In terms of how that actually works? Yeah, in terms of, like, yeah. you know, the learning process. It is, actually, um, as a matter of fact. So the research that existed in the late 40s, early 50s was you know, just like what I'm, what I'm talking about here, you revisit concepts, um, you know, you sort of, it's, it's just different than how we've traditionally learned. And even though that research has been around forever, well, then machine learning, artificial intelligence, basically those concepts started coming out in the fifties and was based on that learning theory. And so we, we've actually done a, a presentation a couple of times, our, one of our co-founders and, and I have done a, a presentation where we and it's it's basically learn like learn like machines learn, which the the you know the ironic thing is machines learn based on how we learn most effectively, um, but <laughs> that's not necessarily how we learn sort of culturally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting, isn't that? Yeah, yeah, but it is actually based very much on sort of human learning um, theory. Yes, isn't that interesting that we understand it theoretically, but we don't understand it from an implementation standpoint? Yeah, it is very, it is very interesting. And I, I think that's changing. I mean, there, you know, our view of, of learning has changed a lot over, you know, maybe the last 10 years, call it. I think academia is, is being disrupted. I think there are different approaches to learning. You know, you see a lot of different, you see some companies, as a matter of fact, coming out with their own learning models that encourage people to go straight to the company as opposed to going through college. And, and so they're just, there's a lot of disruption happening in this field right now. I do think the language learning platforms, they've been doing this for a while and are proving you know, much, much better results in terms of learning and retention of that information. There just aren't a lot of those platforms. In fact, I don't know of any other than what we're doing at Quanhub, I don't know of any that are sort of those same types of platforms for technical skills. And so that's, but we think that's the right approach. And, and I think that's going to continue to evolve over time where more and more of the sort of traditional learning platforms will become that sort of everyday, learn a little bit, 10 to 15 minutes kind of micro learning platform. So this, this, I'm so fascinated with this because um, I just 
my book just became a, um, a virtual book club book. And that's what they do. It's 14 minutes a day for 28 days. Oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason and they're I doing didn't that. I did realize that's what that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Wow. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> That's fascinating. It's really about retention. I mean, yeah. if you learn a lot of information in a short period of time, your it's called the knowledge decay or your forgetting curve is very steep. And so, and, and you know this intuitively when you've studied for a long time on a particular topic and then you didn't use it that next week, two uh -huh. weeks later, you're probably having a hard time remembering it. And, and it's just because knowledge decays very quickly right after you learn it, if you don't use it. And so that's where doing it in smaller pieces and then getting mm -hmm. content back in front of you, you're probably in those 14 days or, or in those 28 days, what's effective is if you see it one day and then a couple of days later, you see a little bit of it again. And so that's actually what starts cementing it in your, in your memory and um, it's called spaced repetition. Mm. And, um, and so that's a very effective way to not just learn it one time, but actually um, to remember it, which is really all that matters. Okay, so if I'm understanding this right, we really need to be implementing what we're learning quickly. You know, they need to be connected to each other. That's exactly right. Implementing it or revisiting it and re or reviewing the content. And, right. and it may be reviewing similar content if you, you know, you may not have the opportunity to use it at work right away, but at least review the concepts, you know, not, not terribly long after you learned it. And that's the type of thing that commits it to longer term memory. I say, okay. Okay. This is so interesting to me. <laughs> it really is. It really is. It, it really, I mean, so if there's, you know, someone listening, they're a small business owner and they're thinking, okay, I, you know, might want to make an adjustment. Um, are, are there like first steps that you would suggest they take to change the way they're I guess, teaching their people how to consider information or, you know, how to absorb information? Well, yeah, I, I think people have a tendency to, it, it makes, I, I don't mean this to sound negative, but it makes yeah. people feel better when they check a box and send everybody to training, right? And, yes. and we're like, okay, we did, we did what we should do. We sent them to data training. And so now, I, now we're good. And, and that's, that's just not, that's sort of not the reality of the situation, right? That yeah. doesn't actually have much of an impact. And people may start understanding a little bit more context, but you know, their ability to change their behaviors is, is fairly limited. And so I, I think it's a matter of, of working with teams. And so you may find, may do it by functional area and, and just start talking about the data. The, I guess the way that I would approach that is less about if you just want to get started and just think about data more every day, then start talking about the data that's relevant in each and every area of the organization. And so I talked about HR earlier. I talked about talent acquisition. Mm -hmm. And so it's not about um, having your recruiters start, start thinking you know, through all of this detailed analysis and predicting where their next hires are going to come from. It's about understanding, you know, why, why let's say you measure satisfaction of, of, um, of recruits going through your interview process and it's not where you want it to be. Okay. Okay. Well, let's ask the answer. Let's the, the first question is why, and, and, you know, maybe it takes 32 days to get a recruit through your process and, and the recruits in a survey are saying it's taken too long. It takes too long to get through the process. Okay, well, now let's actually start analyzing data. So it's through this conversation that a manager would be having, maybe a COO, if it's a small SMB, a COO might be having with the HR leader and bringing in talent acquisition and saying, well, let's, let's figure out what's going on here. That's an exercise in starting to, becoming a, starting to become a more data-driven and data-literate organization. What's happening there? Well, they spend on average the most time in this one particular phase of the process and it's the interview phase with this technical leader. And, and so they're spending the most time there 
and there's a gap and they don't hear back from us on average for a week. Why is that? Well, the technical manager actually is bad at getting feedback to HR. And so then they sit in that step of the process for seven days, not knowing what's happening. That's a bad experience for the candidate. So what we did there is we just dug into the data a little bit more and that's not intimidating. It's just, okay, you keep asking why. Why did that happen? Well, let's see. Let's look at the data and see why that happened. Okay, well, this phase, they took the longest in this phase. Why did they take the longest? How long did it take us to give feedback after the interview? Four days, <laughs> right? So yeah. it's just, it's as much as, it's as simple as that in an SMB um, is starting to be wow. more inquisitive about why things are happening the way they're happening. And it just comes down to start asking questions and then pulling the data together that can answer those questions. And all of a sudden you start be forming habits where people start asking questions and, and, and pulling the data to answer those questions. And that starts permeating throughout the organization. So in an SMB, I think, you know, you don't, you know, if you're a 50 person company, you're probably not implementing a big learning and development initiative. And, you know, and I think that's fine. Yeah. You just need to start asking more questions of the data of, of, as to what's happening, why it's happening, and then start pulling data to answer those questions. And you'll start getting, you'll start moving the needle. I just think that is the best example. I really appreciate that. That made so much sense to me. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. It's not as intimidating as it sounds, no. right? It's, it's, it's actually not, it's not super technical. It's not, it's not difficult. You have that data. It's right there in your applicant tracking system. And uh, assuming people are putting it in um, right. with high quality, back to yeah. data literacy <laughs> skills. <laughs> or if that goes to the other point, right? You exactly. Sure people understand <laughs> why, that that's an important thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh, I, I'm so glad that I asked the question because that makes so much sense to me and it just really is being inquisitive and, and continuing to go deeper to figure out where uh, the, what, like where progress can be made. Absolutely. Wow. Oftentimes what happens though in that type of situation is people will get um, they'll get frustrated because in, you know, many small to mid-sized organizations, their data is a mess. Yeah. And, and so, and oftentimes you can't answer those questions with data because the data is a mess. And, and so, you know, it's a little bit chicken and egg, right? You, you, it's, that sounds simple, what I just said. Um, and it should be um, in cases where it's not though, then that actually starts giving you a sense of, okay, Maybe as an organization now, we need to actually start changing things more fundamentally. Where does that data get created? Who's creating that data? And why is it, why is it so messy? Right. <laughs> and so then it just starts feeding back into, okay, well, we need to improve that as an organization. We need to actually invest in data quality. We need those people to understand their role in that. And so it then feeds other initiatives that improve the health of the data in the organization, not just the desire to use it, um, but, you know, so both kind of push each other, right? So I'm, I'm asking these questions and yes, I have the data to answer them. Great. And I start digging in, I start improving these processes in HR or marketing or sales or whatever. And then I bump into something where, oh, I, I don't have the data to answer this. So why is that? And again, it's now I'm inquisitive as to why that is. And so let's, um, you know, that's maybe again, this in this SMB, maybe the COO is saying, well, why can't we answer this question? And then you can actually get other initiatives that start improving the quality and, and accessibility of that data so that we can continue to answer more and more questions with data. And it, you can just see how it just keeps building on itself to where, you know, at the end of the day, you sort of wake up and, oh my goodness, we're, we're actually fairly data-driven now. And the skills of the organization have come along, you know, with that process. Right. And it wasn't this big, scary, complicated thing. I mean, this, this exactly. seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, that's wow. how you change culture, right? I mean, it's has to be that, you know, it's hard to change culture with a, you know, snap, a snap of your fingers. It has to be in, right. in a sort of sustained process like that. Right. Exactly. That, that, that's right. 
and it is a process. That's the other thing that yeah. people have to realize. It's, it's a journey, a right? We're on a, yeah. we're sort of on a journey. There, there's not an end. That's the, that's the misnomer with training is that you feel like there's an end. You take the yeah. training, you complete the training, you check a box. I've learned this all is well. I'm going to be so much better at my job now. And then you don't use it for a week and now you can't remember it. Yeah. And so that, that's not really how this works, right? We're on a journey. We'll always be on that journey. And, you know, we're always just continuing to um, learn new skills and, and practice those skills to make sure we remember them. Right. Wow. Matt, this is so interesting. I, I'm beyond thrilled that we are having this conversation because I don't think anyone uh, was expecting that this was the conversation we were going to have when and we were going to have when when we decided to talk about data. <laughs> yeah, it's I I'm hoping I think that's changing, but it's going to take it's taking a little while. You know, it's yeah. just it, it's just intimidating. You know, people have these preconceived notions. So it's it's um you know it's we're we have advocates out there of how this this can be something that's not so intimidating can be something that we all that we all do and and I we're going to get there it's just um, yeah. there's a movement here around data literacy and it's 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 a groundswell but it's you know it's like anything it's just going to take some time sure sure it's it's really one step at a time right yeah. and 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 doing it the way that you're talking about it makes it um almost as if you're doing it without realizing it. It's just right. wanting to know, wanting information, really. That's right. And figuring That's out exactly how to right. get it. Yeah. yeah, it starts with inquisitiveness, just like we said yeah. in questions. Yeah, yeah, which I'm all about. I mean, discovery is like my, that and clarity are probably yeah. my two favorite words. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like those yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I imagine you do. Uh, well, my gosh, thank you so much for this. Will you tell the listeners, you know, how they can find you and whatever they should know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are at uh, quanthub.com, Q-U-A-N-T-H-U-B.com. And I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. Would love to hear from, from any of you. Um, happy to get people on a, on a free trial on learning data skills and, and doing it a little bit every day, just like we talked about earlier. And so that's what we're on a mission to improve the data fluency of individuals and organizations all over the world. And we think this is a global movement and this is the skill of the future. So happy to hear from any of you with, with your thoughts on, on that. I love connecting with people on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, I'm on either one of those. So um, yeah, or if you want to email me, I'm at matt at quanthub.com. We're happy to hear from you. Terrific. Thank you so much. I really hope people reach out because th this is something we all need to be doing. And boy, you know, once you get that thought process going, you can use it in every aspect of your business. Can Absolutely. Yeah, that, that thought process really doesn't just have, have to do with data skills. It's just a matter of, you know, how you go about learning. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love this whole concept. Well, my gosh, like I said, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Diane. I appreciate it. I, I enjoy talking about this topic. <laughs> I know I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really great. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, a production of Evergreen Podcasts. Discover more episodes of this podcast and explore others at evergreenpodcast.com. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And if you're looking to get your sales strategy headed in the right direction, pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Are you tired of the same old productivity hacks? Have you read the top 20 books on effectiveness and yet your work days and email inbox still causing anxiety, burnout, and even depression? Ready to learn the latest in brain-based modalities, techniques, and technologies to optimize your success and well-being? Welcome to the Focus to Evolve podcast where we'll illuminate your path to spacious productivity and balanced thriving. Each week, we dive into deeply insightful and immediately impactful methods to help you become highly effective while promoting health, profitability, and well-being 
Say goodbye to the trance of busyness and hello to your highest potential. It's time to discover a new way of accelerating your mission, growth, and purpose. Join us on the Focus to Evolve podcast and get ready to live your most joyful, productive, and fulfilling life.